Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Apollo's Odyssey. I'm your host, Apollo Asteria, and tonight I want to cover the latest in UFO disclosure, or as they call it, UAP in the government. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to basically kind of go through the latest updates because I haven't done that on my show in a while. I know the last few shows were either interviews or me just taking a random topic and breaking it down for you all. So I haven't really gone through like the latest of kind of what's been going on, like, you know, what the government has been disclosing, what's going on with the UFO, UAP task force and all of that. So I kind of had a few different things that I wanted to break down in regards to all of that. Uh, I think some interesting topics uh, came out just this past week. And uh, also... I just got back from the Star Knowledge Conference, which was really incredible. I had a really, really amazing time. Um, I mean, honestly, probably one of the best times I've had at a conference in a really long time. Uh, so, you know, I definitely enjoyed being there with everyone, making new friends. I, I feel I came out of it feeling like I was leaving family behind, you know, coming back home. So, you know, it was just a really amazing weekend. Uh, I actually delayed my flight. I was supposed to leave at 6 a.m. yesterday and, or the day before, I believe it was. And I ended up delaying my flight so that I could stay behind and uh, watch my new friends perform at Marty Indian School. And I got to meet the youth there, which is really incredible. Um, I think it's really great what they're doing with that school because actually before I left, I saw a documentary on um basically how the once the natives were put into reservations uh i think back in like the 1800s or whenever it was that uh catholic schools came in our government came in and put catholic schools on these reservations and forced the native kids to become indoctrinated and basically lose their culture you know cut their hair and which is very important to them and you know that i thought that was really sad. I mean, I was literally like crying watching this before I left and I had no idea I was going to actually end up being on the reservation and uh, going to one of these schools. So it was really surreal to go there and see that and meet the children there. Um, so basically with this school, they were able to take the culture back into their own hands and start teaching their own culture again instead of indoctrinating them. And I think, I believe they were able to change that around when the Freedom of Information or the Freedom of Religion Act came out. Uh, which is really great. So, um, you know, and then like, I, I'm actually part Cherokee. I know I don't really <laughs> look like it, but uh, my great grandmother was Cherokee. My great grandfather met her in Oklahoma near a Cherokee reservation, which she was on. And apparently my ancestors walked the trail of tears. Um, so, you know, it was really great being able to connect with my heritage in that way. I learned a lot about the Cherokee heritage that I did not know before. Uh, I was, I actually was just able to order some books to like learn more on all of that. And the star knowledge that they have, the ancient knowledge that, that the Lakota people have is really something. Let me tell you, they have some really incredible ancient knowledge, which I mean, I couldn't even begin to tell you. Uh, there's this really amazing book I got there on their star knowledge symbols. Um, I should have 
pulled it up here. Maybe I'll do a different show on it later uh, because I can't <laughs> I can't pronounce the name of the cover. I know I see Senior Gigi in the comments here. If you know what the book was called, <laughs> please comment. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you know I, I learned a lot and it was really incredible. I hope to go back for the Sundance this year. Might actually go to the uh, Serpent Mound event as well. But we'll definitely be doing a lot with uh star knowledge in the future really incredible um so and by the way i also uh i just mentioned the symbols uh the star knowledge symbols and that is something that i find really fascinating because i, I actually have been wanting to change up the symbols that i put on my shaman spears that i make here uh oh and senior gg is saying it's uh 11 11 symbols um, so I think that's the book is called something, I don't know, in Native American and then 1111 symbols. So if you want to try to find it, but so the symbols, I've actually been wanting to put new symbols on my spears for a while now. And I swear, I kid you not, I was seeing them in my mind and I didn't know what it was I was seeing. And after going there, now I realize what those were. So, um, I'm planning on starting to use those symbols on my spears now, which you know, so far I've been using crop circles as the symbols on my spears and some Egyptian glyphs. And by the way, if you want to support me and support my show, please go over to shamanspears.com. Uh, hold on a second. Let me pull this up here. So, of course, I make, you probably heard this many times before, but I make uniquely handcrafted energy channeling devices, which I invented myself. And those are all for the purpose of channeling energy. I never make any two the same. Uh, They're all made out of bamboo, so they are hollow. They are filled with copper coils, crystals, magnets, and sand I collect from sacred places around the world down the insides. Um, They're all painted with crop circles that have been found around the world. And they basically amplify energy like times 10. I mean, very powerful um, and the holidays are coming up, so I want to remind you all that they make really great Christmas gifts. If you know anyone who, you know, would really appreciate something like this, I do next day shipping on all orders. Um, and they're all, like I said, I never make any to the same. They're all completely 100% unique. And ordering any of these will support my show and my mission, what I'm doing, so... Uh, very much appreciated. I have a few left from my last two collections. And then I will be, I'm actually in the works of a new collection. I finished some before the conference, but they're not up yet because I think I want to finish all the ones from this collection before posting them. So I should be doing that pretty soon here. I'm hoping I'll actually have that collection basically ready by the end of this weekend. But I have quite a few from the last two collections still available. So if you would like to check those out, please do. And hopefully I can get those sent to you and you'll have some really great Christmas gifts for people. Um, I also have, you know, some other art and organite materials that I created also on my site if you want to check those out. All right. So in tonight's show, uh, I'm going to be going over some of the latest in disclosure. And before I get into that, um, I think it's uh, time for a little celebration here because NASA's Artemis craft just launched today, which I think is really amazing. Um, oops, wrong article here. Uh, let me go back here. Uh, so I actually wanted to be out there for this launch because I have a major affinity with Artemis actually. I you know I, I think uh, that goddess archetype is something that I definitely really resonate with. And uh, you know I really wanted to be out there for this launch, but unfortunately I couldn't make it out. Uh, let me just stop sharing this here for a second. But I actually uh, found out about this from my previous show where I filmed live at Edwards Air Force Base uh, at the air show there. I think it was a few weeks ago, a few weekends ago. Um, I actually went to the STEM show there and met some people from NASA and they had a whole exhibit 
on the Artemis craft, the Artemis ship. And uh, basically what they're planning on doing with that is they want to send the first woman to the moon and the first, uh, I think the first person of color to the moon. Um, and also they're playing on setting up an Artemis base on the moon. So really cool stuff. Uh, I know, you know, maybe there's like a secret space program and we've already been there and there's, you know, bases on the dark side of the moon. You know, I'm not saying none of that is true, but I'm just saying that it's pretty cool that like officially they're sending stuff up there. I know, you know, there's launches taking place every day, you know, in Cape Canaveral and, uh, you know, at Vandenberg and places like that. And there's, who knows, there's probably our ready a lot of other things up there but uh you know this is cool that they're doing a public launch and uh so let me just read the article i know that actually took off today and i was actually invited to the launch party they said i could come dress as artemis and it would be filmed on the live stream with nasa which i i really wish i could have done that so um they actually oh, i keep sharing the wrong thing here sorry about that um they actually rescheduled this launch, I believe, uh, about five or six times already uh, due to the hurricane and different reasons. So they were actually playing the launch at the day I was the last day of the conference I was just at. So I didn't think I'd be able to make it out. And then I assumed that maybe they were going to reschedule it again. But it turns out they just rescheduled it for today. So Unfortunately, I missed it, but I don't think this was really necessarily a manned craft. I think the one that they're going to put the people on will happen later. So maybe I'll be able to go out and live stream for that one whenever that happens. But let me read you the article here. This is with ABC News. Artemis launched live updates. Artemis moon rocket lifts off from Cape Canaveral. The Artemis one launched early Wednesday morning. The latest attempt to send an unmanned capsule near the moon after a series of postponements due to weather and mechanical issues. NASA pushed back a takeoff schedule for Monday after Hurricane Nicole made landfall about 85 miles south of Cape Canaveral, Florida. The launch marks the first step in an ambitious plan to establish a long-term presence on the moon for scientific discovery and economic development. Eventually, the Artemis expedition could lead to the first crewed space trip to Mars, according to NASA. Uh, and the president celebrated the launch of Artemis 1 and expressed excitement for the goals of future missions. NASA's Artemis is in flight, Biden tweeted Wednesday afternoon. This ship will enable the first woman and the first person of color to set foot on the lunar surface and will lead countless students to become explorers and show America's limitless possibilities to the world. And here's a photo of that taking off there. Um, okay, just going through this here. I guess it's not really anything important. Just some photos of the takeoff there. So, yeah, pretty cool stuff. And uh, also, what's interesting about the Artemis craft is they also have this Orion spacecraft connected with it. So, let me read you the logistics on that because it's pretty interesting. So, NASA's Artemis uh, cameras to offer new views of Orion, Earth, and Moon. During Artemis 1, NASA's Space Launch System rocket will send the agency's Orion spacecraft on a trek 40,000 miles beyond the moon before returning to Earth. To capture the journey, the rocket and spacecraft are equipped with cameras that will collect valuable engineering data and share a unique perspective of humanity's return to the moon. There are 24 cameras on the rocket and spacecraft, 8 on SLS, and 16 on Orion. To document essential mission events including liftoff, ascent, solar array development, external rocket inspections, landing and recovery, and capture images of Earth and the Moon. On the rocket, four cameras around the engine section point up toward Orion. Two cameras on the inner tank by the top of boosters will capture booster separation, and two cameras on the launch vehicle stage adapter will capture core stage separation. 
the eight cameras will cycle through a pre-programmed sequence during the launch and ascent. On Orion, an external camera mounted on the crew module adapter will show the SLS rocket's ascent, providing the rocket cam view the public often sees during launches. Another camera will provide a view of service module panel jettison and solar array wing deployment. Four cameras attached to the spacecraft solar array wings on the service module will help engineers assess the overall health of the outside of Orion and can capture a selfie view of the spacecraft with the Earth or Moon in the background. Each of Orion's four solar arrays has a commercial off-the-shelf camera mounted at the tip that has been highly modified for use in space, providing a view of the spacecraft exterior. Uh, the rays can adjust their position relative to the rest of the spacecraft, which will optimize the collection of sunlight converted into electricity to power Orion. This also allows flight controllers in the Mission Control Center uh, at NASA Johnson to point the cameras at different parts of the spacecraft uh, for inspections and to document surroundings, including the Earth and Moon. And so here's what that looks like there, where all the cameras are located. Um, yeah, and so basically it's just discussing the cameras here and should be really interesting because it says here, and I'm just skipping around here, that uh, through Artemis missions, NASA will land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon, paving the way for a long-term lunar presence and serving as a stepping stone to send astronauts to Mars. So, uh, you know, this is really amazing. And I don't think any of these articles really mentioned, but I actually interviewed uh, someone who worked for NASA that was working the booth that I went to, the NASA booth I went to at um, the air show at Edwards Air Force Base. And this uh, representative of NASA basically told me that um, that they actually plan on putting an Artemis base on the moon. I'm not sure how publicly they're talking about that right now, but that's really incredible because that means that if we have a base there. That basically means that they're planning on keeping a base on the moon, which would be a space base for us, which means, you know, in the future, maybe we'll be taking off, going to the moon, landing there, and then, you know, going from the base there to Mars or other places. So this is a really incredible step forward in regards to becoming a spacefaring civilization. And uh, I think this is a really great thing. Also, something that they didn't mention here, um, but a connection I'm making with this from my research, which... I normally talk about my solutions for humanity presentation, uh, would, which one solution would be asteroid mining. And uh, I think from the work that I've read from my friend Books Agnew, who is an engineer who wrote books on asteroid mining, is that uh, basically the first step to asteroid mining, which would be a really great thing that would be very beneficial to humanity in regards to um, finding more energy to power everything on, on our planet would be uh, basically the first step to doing that would be setting a base on the moon and then also setting a GPS system on the moon and, you know, in other places in the surrounding space around us. So, you know, doing this means that we are taking the next step forward to doing that. And there are an, there is enough money worth of rare earth minerals on just one asteroid near us to be worth basically, I think it was $10 quadrillion, which would be if split up evenly between everyone on the planet, that would be enough money for every person on the planet to have a billion dollars. So that's really amazing. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think that, you know, it's bad for us to be spending so much money on these space missions when, you know, there's so much here on Earth that we need to take care of. But in my opinion, moving forward in this way will help us to 
uh, create more abundance on our planet. So I think it's a major stepping stone that is indeed uh, much better for us. And <laughs> so, so I'm reading Sylvan Forge's comment, a stepping stone further out indeed. And Stephen A here says, there are already bases on the moon. Look up Bruce C's. Uh, yeah, I, I believe you. I believe you. I'm With this show tonight, I'm just going over, like I said, what the government is saying is happening in full disclosure. So I want to remind you all about that. It's, I'm just reporting tonight on what the government is disclosing, not what I think is already out there. So... <laughs> Um, just going back to your comments here. Uh, okay. Oh, and Al Bowman here says, yes, according to your Halloween costume pack, you are indeed marriage material. <laughs> Sorry, I did not even read this comment before I started reading it. Too bad most males in this century could never keep up with your brain power. Thank you, Al. I appreciate it. And I was not reading that comment to uh, bring up my own ego there. I just put that up there before I started reading that. So <laughs> but I appreciate that, Al. Thank you. Um, okay. So moving forward. All right. So there's a lot also happening in regards to disclosure with our government that our government is reporting on, uh, the United States government. And let me see where I should start with this. Okay, um, I believe this one came out today. Let me see here. Yep, this came out earlier today. So I'll start with this article. And this says, members of Pentagon's UFO task force briefed Canadian military officials this year. Members of the Pentagon's UFO task force briefed Canadian uh, military officials earlier this year a previously unreported meeting that was revealed this week. The February 22nd briefing was led by a U.S. Air Force intelligence officer who contributed to a headline-grabbing June 2021 report on recent American military sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAP, the term U.S. authorities use for what are more commonly known as unidentified flying objects, and UFOs. According to a document released on November 14th, the February briefing was delivered by multiple members of the Pentagon's UAP task force and attended by 10 Canadian defense officials, including personnel from Royal Canadian Air Force and Canadian Forces Intelligence Command, which is responsible for collecting and assessing military intelligence. The document provided a few other details. Um, okay, I'm just going through this. Okay, uh, so officials from the Department of Defense UAP Task Force and National Intelligence Manager for Aviation met with Canadian Department, blah, blah, blah. Okay, just going through this. Um, it's clear that the American UAP task force wants to work with our government. Conservative defense critic uh, James Beeson told ctvnews.ca on Tuesday from Ottawa, any attempts from government or Canada officials to downplay either the data or the reports could would be completely unacceptable. Beeson believes Canada should be following the United States lead in investigating UAP. The Canadian government needs to implement a scientific plan to identify the origins and intent of UAP. Beeson, member of parliament for um, Silkirk Interlake Eastman in Manitoba explained, uh, conservatives believe the best way to start that process is for government to adopt a streamlined whole of government approach to standardize the collection of reports across numerous departments and contractors. All efforts undertaken to investigate UAP should be made public in a responsible manner. For its part, the Canadian military routinely states that it does not typically investigate sightings of unknown 
or unexplained phenomena outside the context of investigating credible threats, potential threats, or potential distress in the case of search and rescue. Since 2016, at least four cases have met that same criteria. The single February 2022 briefing from U.S. officials was revealed by Canada's Department of National Defense in a November 14th reply to questions posed by the Conservative Member of Parliament, Larry McGuire. McGuire, the Conservative representative for Brandon Soros in southwestern Manitoba, has used an accountability mechanism MPs have to ask the federal government to provide a written account of alleged contacts with U.S. military and intelligence officials. And so it doesn't really seem like there's much more to this article. I'm just skimming through this here. So basically, to sum this up, um, the Canadian government is going to start being involved with our U.S. Uh, our UAP task force, it's looking like, uh, and that they're demanding more clarity to all these sightings and any what we may view as potential threats. Um, they want to be read into it. So I think uh, that's really interesting. And just going through the comments here. Okay, um, so that, sorry. Okay, so let me move on to the next thing. And I think uh, this is really fascinating here. Um, so I believe this just came out a week ago. And this is an article by The Hill. <clears throat> Uh, pro and anti UFO factions in government. It wouldn't be the first time. Shortly before the release of the second government report on unidentified flying objects, it, as many years, dueling narratives emerged in the media. A New York Times article poured cold water on theories of alien visitation and extraordinary technology alluded to in a 2021 report on unidentified aerial phenomena. Citing government officials, the Times pointedly downplayed recent military UAP incidents as foreign drones, balloons, or airborne trash. Among several eyebrow-raising quotes, one source sharply criticized their office and the director of national intelligence colleagues, stating that they don't want to talk about UAPs because they really, really don't know what the hell they are. The Daily... <laughs> Basically, they're saying they're probably aliens. Uh, the Daily Mail's sources disclosed several key details about the report prior to the release. According to the U.S. government, uh, cannot explain more than 150 UFO encounters reported over just this past year. In short, competing functions appear to be vying for control of the UAP narrative. If this is indeed the case, history is repeating itself. From 1951 to 1953, Captain Edward Ruppelt served as the first director of Project Blue Book, the Air Force's two-decade-long UAP investigation. Ruppelt, widely regarded as an effective and objective uh, investigator manager, was generally perplexed by the UFO phenomena. Uh, as recounted in his 1956 book, Ruppel frequently found himself caught between two bitterly divided factions, all through military intelligence circles, uh, or all through intelligence circles, Ruppel wrote, people had chosen sides on UFOs. According to Ruppel, a 1948 Air Force intelligence assessment came to the remarkable conclusion that UAP were interplanetary. The report worked its way up into the higher echelons of the Air Force, but was kicked back by the Air Force Chief of Staff General Hoyt Vandenberg for lack of hard proof. Facing intense pressure to resolve the UAP conundrum, Ruppelt wrote, the people on the UFO project then tried a new hypothesis. UFOs don't exist. Intelligence 
analyst uh, rapidly learned that a quick snappy, it was a balloon, satisfied their superiors. Easy answers to perplexing high-quality UAP reports got recognition. Feathers were stuck in caps from Air Force Intelligence Headquarters up to the Pentagon. As a result, Rupel writes, many analysts jumped on the anti-UFO bandwagon. At the same time, a stubborn pro-saucer faction remained convinced that UFOs were interplanetary spaceships. Others weren't quite as bold and just believed that a good deal more should be known about the UFOs. According to Ruppelt, uh, those in pro-saucer camp weren't a bunch of nuts or crackpots. They ranged down through the ranks from generals and top-grade civilians. On the outside, their views were backed up by civilian scientists. Beyond heated disagreements, the two competing UFO factions sought to influence the media. Ruppelt describes a two-part 1949 article on UAP that had considerable effect on public opinion. Was the Air Force officially reporting on the UFOs for the first time? Just like the recent New York Times piece, the 1949 article casually admitted that a few UFO sightings couldn't be explained. But as Rupel wrote, the reader didn't have much chance to think about this fact because 99% of the story was devoted to the anti-saucer side of the problem. It was a full and negative approach. Uh, of note, the article started out by psychologically conditioning the reader against UAP. By the time the reader gets to the meat of the article, he feels like a rich, full-blown jerk for ever thinking about UFOs. Critically, Rupel was continually being told to tell the media about the sightings reports weren't solved. Don't mention the unknowns. With noteworthy parallels, the recent New York Times piece focuses almost exclusively on unresolved UAP cases. Importantly, it also offers explanations to two well-known UFO videos recorded by a U.S. Navy fighter jet in 2015. Uh, citing Pentagon calculations, the Times article states that the object in one video is moving at about 30 miles per hour. But if these calculations are identical to those long promoted by UFO debunkers, the Pentagon has some explaining to do. No fewer than four aviators, including a fighter pilot airborne during the Go Fast encounter, agree that a key figure in the calculation is likely... Oh, whoa, what just happened? Uh, sorry, I don't know what just happened here. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, sorry, I just lost my spot here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, it says... Uh, no fewer than four aviators, including fire pilot airborne during the GoFast encounter, agree that a key figure in the calculations is likely not very good data. If the number is miscalculated or otherwise significantly off mark, the explanation for the GoFast UFO video put forth in the Times article is invalidated. In another video known as Gimbal, an object appears to spin or rotate as it skims over the clouds. According to the New York Times sources, the object's apparent rotation is an artifact of the camera. But this is a remarkable feat of misdirection. The rotation is a red herring. The gimbal encounter is fascinating because, as noted, aerospace engineer Steve Justice explains, the object travels at high altitude with no discernible wings or means of propulsion. Important importantly, the Navy air crew that recorded the video maintain a stable radar lock on the object. In this regard, knowing the distance between the object and the jet that recorded the video allows UAP sleuths and engineers like Justice to establish the UFO's perplexing lack of wings or obvious means of propulsion. But that's not all. Earlier this year, I spoke with a senior engineer intimately familiar with the optical system that recorded the gimbal video. He explicitly disagreed that the rotation observed in the video is an artifact of the camera system. 
an active duty F a 18 weapon systems officer who uses the system on a near daily basis disagreed as well. Perhaps more importantly for meticulous geometrical reconstructions of the gimbal encounter show that the object's rotation matches its flight path. And this is particularly significant blow to the theory put forth in the New York times piece. If the government stands by these quick, snappy explanations for the gimbal and go fast videos, it must show its work. Most glaringly, the Times article offers no explanation for the best known UFO incident in recent years. In 2004, four Navy aviators observed a tic tac shaped uh, object exhibit extraordinary flight characteristics off the coast of Southern California. When accounting for the position of the sun that day, a video of the object captured by a follow-on flight quite clearly shows a capsule-shaped object with no wings, control surfaces, or discernible means of propulsion. Ultimately, history cannot be allowed to repeat itself. The analysts now facing intense pressure for answers must not return to decades-long practice of force-fitting, simplistic, unscientific explanations onto highly credible UFO reports. And so this is really amazing that, you know, there are actually mainstream media sources that are coming out um, demanding answers now. I wouldn't have expected that to really happen, uh, you know, at this time. So it's really good to see that. And I'm just going back through your comments here. Uh, Dave Dennis here says, we have an exciting Star Trek of future ahead of us. Just as Dr. Michael Solo suggests, hopefully we'll be invited to join the Galactic Federation once we get our corrupt governments overhauled. I agree. I think that will be amazing, and I hope that happens soon. All right. And Stephen A. says, we will never have real disclosure. You know, unfortunately, it's like... You know, who knows? From a lot of different sources I've read, including the minister, prime minister of the Space Administration for Israel, Jaime Shed. I'm not sure if I said that term right, but he came out, uh, I believe it was last year or the year before, saying that our government's been working with at least four ET races. And this guy is an extremely credible person. Um, we've also had the ex-Prime Minister of Defense for Canada come out and say the same thing in a press conference, I believe it was seven, nine, ten years ago now. So, you know, it's, I mean, if that's the case, and our government has been doing this work already, um, then that means that what we're receiving right now in these articles and with, you know, these ufo commissions or whatever they're called with the said the ufo hearings what we're getting is soft disclosure this is a soft disclosure program um which you know if you think about in some ways it could make sense because you know maybe they're worried that some people can't handle the information that's out there maybe some people wouldn't be able to handle the idea that we're not alone in the universe and there might be a major political uprising uh i think maybe they're worried about that but you know why why was it ever a secret in the first place that's my response to that question why do we have the secrecy in the first place like obviously the ancient people knew about extraterrestrials they have you know tons of tablets and you know stories and myths about them uh obviously they were familiar about that and i think at a certain point you know, people were threatened to not talk about it anymore. And then a few generations later, um, you know, people like lost the knowledge and here we're at right now. And I think this is all done for a means of control, unfortunately. But, um, you know, I think uh, real disclosure comes down to all of us. We don't need to wait for the government to tell us what's happening. Uh, I think some people won't accept it until they see that, unfortunately, including many people I know personally. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in to some regards, they've already admitted this. And, you know, it's uh, it's unfortunate that it's happening in such a slow manner. I think a lot of this also has to do with 
you know, them releasing disclosure on a certain level also means releasing suppressed technologies. Um, you know, things that have been kept secret that would probably bring the human race if, you know, these certain technologies were released, these suppressed technologies, we may have free energy for the entire planet, which means that, you know, we would have a very abundant future for humanity. And, um, you know, maybe some powers that be don't want that because they want us under control and they want us to pay money to the people at the top. And continue doing that so you know that's where we're at and i hope that things change in the future and i really think it comes down to all of us it really does uh you we are all disclosure everyone in this community we are disclosure we are and we have the power to do that so um, I also had some different articles about UFO sightings that were more recent. I feel like I've been going on for a little while now. So let me see here if I want to share these. Um, okay, actually, this one's kind of interesting. So I think this was put out. Oh, this was put up, published today. Yeah. Okay, this is the U.S. Sun. A mass sighting, horror details about UFO traveling at 72,000 miles per hour and sucking water from the Michigan lakes, revealed in Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, new chilling information on a mass UFO sighting that led to hundreds of 911 calls from a small Michigan town has been revealed in a recent episode of Unsolved Mysteries. So this didn't happen recently, but basically this information is being uncovered more now. But on March 8th, 1994, more than 300 people in 42 countries reported seeing strange hovering objects scream through the skies at 72,000 miles per hour. Two even said they watched in horror as a UFO sucked out fresh water with impossible technology. Uh, while stories from one of America's greatest mysteries vary slightly from person to person, there are several key similarities in the descriptions of what Michigan residents saw. Unexplainable lights were spotted from various towns surrounding the Great Lake, as well as five or six cylindrically shaped objects that moved in a concerning circular path, according to reports. Jack Beauchamp, a former meteorologist, have been tracking UFOs that 1994 sky while he worked late at his National Weather Service job inside the Muskegon County Airport. For hours, Bouchon watched the mysterious movements and confirmed that the reports were indeed legitimate. They weren't planes, the radio operator told Detroit Free Press in 1995. Planes show as pinpoints on the scope. There were the size of half a thumbnail. They were from five to 12,000 feet at times, moving all over the place. Three were moving towards Chicago. Jeff Vethaus, who has a Holland Police Department officer at the time, said he witnessed flying objects that were green, red, and white through binoculars, according to the incident report. Others said the UFOs looked like twinkling Christmas lights zooming through the evening sky. Two campers even said they watched in horror as a UFO sucked up fresh water using a creepy mechanism, director of the Unsolved Mysteries episode, Gabe Torres, claims. Uh, that's a hotspot. was called a UFO hotspot that area around Lake Michigan. The Great Lakes are the largest sources of fresh water in North America. So if you're seeing a lot of UFOs and these people report this sort of water spout going up into it and not coming down... Do these things use water in their travels? Bouchon eventually met with ufologist Michael Lords in an attempt to make sense of the confusing incident. Uh, the two worked together to draw a map gallery that illustrates the movements of the UFOs. Despite the unprecedented number of sightings, the details surrounding the UFOs remain unclear. With officials ruling out commonplace objects like small planes, gas, weather balloons, military aircraft, or debris, the Chicago Tribune 
reported in 1995. So that's pretty wild. Um, you know, <laughs> to me, like, honestly, I, I don't really talk about UFO sightings on my show very much because to me, it's like, I mean, I've seen UFOs. I think maybe most of you have probably seen UFOs. You know, I, I don't need to prove to myself that they're real. I already know they're out there. <laughs> so, you know, I, it's not really that important to me. But, um, you know, it's kind of interesting sometimes. So this one actually just came out, I believe, this week as well. Let me see the date on this article. Um, okay, this came out a few days ago. And this one's uh, a UFO photograph submerged in Lake Titicaca, which is obviously on the border of Peru and Bolivia right here. A very interesting place uh, when it comes to ancient aliens and uh, ancient me megalithic sites around the world. Lake Titicaca is a very, very interesting place. So uh, transmedium UFO photographs submerged in Lake Titicaca, Bolivia. Multiple witnesses in Bolivia claim to have seen a UFO descend from the sky and submerge into Lake Titicaca before bursting out of the water and departing the scene. According to a local media report, this very weird case occurred earlier this month in an unnamed community near the site, which serves as a border between the country and Peru. Several residents say that the peculiar sighting began when they first spotted a puzzling object hovering overhead. To their profound surprise, the UFO suddenly dropped from the sky and sank into the waters of Lake Titicaca. One quick-thinking witness managed to snap a photograph of the object while it was submerged, seen in video above. I don't see a video above there. That's weird. Um... Okay, and although the image is decidedly hard to decipher, it would seem that the oddity did not remain underwater for very long, as witnesses contend that after a short period of time, the curious craft shot out of the lake and subsequently flew back into space. What exactly the object could have been is a mystery, although those who saw the UFO believe that it may have been extraterrestrial in nature. Alas, with the craft having come and gone, their account is largely all that remains of the strange incident, along with the aforementioned uh, ambiguous photo. The case will, not, will no doubt intrigue UFO enthusiasts who have long suspected that some of these craft are transmedium vehicles that can travel both in both air and water. With that in mind, what do you think the witnesses saw as well as photographed in the lake. And so here is... Regresamos al programa con esta conmoción en un pueblo de Bolivia, donde... Okay, I don't know. Okay, so that's that there. Unfortunately, you know, it would have been great if the person actually took a video, but apparently they just took a photo. So, um, yeah, but, you know, several witnesses saw it. That's pretty crazy. All right, so I'm just going back through the comments here. Um, okay, so thanks everyone for joining me tonight. And before I go here, I want to share that... Oh, also, I forgot to mention that I'll be speaking at a conference in Mount Shasta coming up here. Um, if you want to check out this conference, it is at Awake awakewithinthedreamproductions.com and the conference is called don't really have it on the site okay here we go uh, I don't think they have much up on the site yet but uh, the conference is called Living Truth Summit 2 and uh, activating the 12 pair of cranial nerves and that event is March 24th it will be in Mount Shasta at the Masonic Lodge in Mount Shasta. And uh, it's going to be a really incredible event. I don't know if they have me up on the page. My, my friend Brad Olson here is going to be speaking at it. Um, these are some of the people. Let me scan through here and see if my bio comes up. Oh, there's me. So I will be speaking there. Really excited about that. It looks like the tickets here are 
288 to 488 dollars uh price range for that my friend samuel sacred pendants will be speaking lots of amazing people so it's gonna be a really great event um okay here's the flyer here uh living true summit to uh shalomar is running that and uh yeah so it'll be like a weekend event march 24th to 27th of this coming year so if you would like to join me for that, I am really excited to be there and tickets are on sale now. And that is, uh, you can just look up the Li living truth summit and you should be able to find it there. Also, if you want to help support my show, please go check out my art over at shamanspears.com because, uh, that's really what funds me and keeps me going. Uh, you know, I think I've mentioned before many times on this show, I actually cannot work in the entertainment industry anymore, unfortunately, because I refuse to compromise my health with jabs. So uh, this is what really supports me and keeps my show going. Uh, here's one of my spears here. They range from small one size to large staff size. Uh, I have really all different sizes and I can do next day shipping on all orders so um again they make really great christmas presents so uh would be really awesome if you wanted to go check those out and i have a few left from my last two collections so again that's at shamanspears.com and if you want to check those out the i have the site actually scrolling across the bottom of the screen here the ticker at the bottom of the screen here uh tells the name of the site was just shamanspears.com so uh, thanks everyone for joining me tonight and I hope to see you all again soon. I don't know if I'll be going live doing my usual uh, Wednesday show next week because uh, I may be busy for the holidays. So, or maybe not. I might be able to go live. I'm not really sure. So I'll let you know. But uh, if you can, please just go and hit the notification bell. That way you always know when I go live and you'll get a notification off your YouTube app whenever I do so. Uh, because sometimes I randomly go live, like decide to go to different events and go live. You know, sometimes I do interviews on days that I wouldn't normally have my show. So uh, make sure you stay updated with all that. So thanks everyone for joining me tonight. And until next time on Apollo's Odyssey, over and out.